Good evening, I'm John Carter. Welcome to Poland Daily. The Law and Justice Party's programme ahead of the autumn elections to the same and Senate is likely to be unveiled in the coming weeks. The debate, which took place last weekend during the party convention in Katowice, appears to be the basis for the election programme. There is a great challenge ahead of us to finish this reform that we started. The dust has not settled in this particular battle, but our will is very strong. Our will to change the Polish judiciary in a way that would enable it to serve the country. Every judge deserves respect, but what makes a good judge is that he knows his role in the society and that he works independently, free from pressures from the outside. Then he can make a just judgment, which is all that we want. Our agenda for 2015, 2016 and 2017 can be described in one word – dignity. The rebuilding of dignity in Polish homes, in historical and social policy. Now, if the voters trust us again, we want to propose a big agenda of economic development. The wealth of the Polish nation is our aspirational goal. I deeply believe that the upcoming years will allow countless Poles to be happy they live in Poland, that leaving the country will no longer be the only way to improve one's economic situation. This can be seen in the data. There is a growing number of Poles returning to our homeland, from England, from Ireland, Western Europe, because they see that they have perspectives here. Keeping this in mind, I believe in our win. I believe that Poland will continue to have good helmsmen. Full steam ahead. We will be carrying out a substantive, thought-through policy based on knowledge, a policy that will at the same time build credibility, because there is no democracy without credibility. If the political groups which are taking part in the elections are misleading the nation, promising things they cannot do and very often just don't want to do, then the entire political machine becomes one big manipulation. Law and Justice is a democratic party and so is our coalition. We must continue down this path, because there is no other good path for our homeland. The leader of the Polish People's Party, Władysław Kosiniak Kamysz, has laid out some difficult conditions for the head of the civic platform, Grzegorz Sahetne. An opposition coalition without left wing parties supposedly doesn't fit in with civic platform strategy, as it limits their chances in the upcoming parliamentary elections. On the other hand, a wider coalition could mean Hetina's party loses many of its local activists, which is allegedly the source of a lot of frustration in party ranks. According to the opinion poll conducted by Kanta Public for the Civic Platform Party, a wide election opposition bloc consisting of the Civic Platform, Democratic Left Alliance and Polish People's Party could take on the United Right in the autumn parliamentary elections. The currently ruling Law and Justice Party would get around 40% of the votes, while the United Opposition only 3% less. On its own, the Civic Platform would end up far below the Law and Justice, while the two Liberal parties wouldn't even enter the Parliament. According to many political commentators, the survey is an attempt by the Civic Platform Party to put pressure on the the Polish People's Party to join a wide electoral bloc. However, Professor Norbert Maliszewski, a political scientist, argues that the Polish People's Party will never take such a step, since it's trying to preserve its identity. A wide coalition isn't very likely. The Polish People's Party prefers to run on its own and retain its identity than to join a coalition and lose it. The survey is simply a media thing. It's very unlikely that such a coalition will form. Another political scientist, Professor Kazimierz Kik, believes that building a wide coalition bloc based solely on a mutual lack of sympathy towards the currently ruling Law and Justice Party is a mistake that will only lower their support. The calculations of politicians and party activists aren't always the same as the wishes of the voters. The one mistake they make is they assume that most of the society doesn't like the Law and Justice Party. If they try to tie together several parties which are so different in their views and programs, based on that lack of sympathy, then they don't see things clearly. Most of the pre-election research points to the fact that one united opposition bloc won't be enough to win in the parliamentary elections this autumn. It remains to be seen what the decision of the Polish People's Party and civic platform will be, while the United Right continues to benefit from the opposition's uncertainty. The parents of Vincent Lambert have announced that they will no longer oppose the decision of the court, which ordered their son to stop being fed.
The 42-year-old has been in a state described by doctors as minimal consciousness for several years after suffering injuries in a motorcycle accident. Televisio Republica correspondent for France, Zbigniew Stefaniak, has more. Piers Lambert's parents will cease to fight legally for their son's life. In an official letter they wrote, they say their son's death was forced on him by the French courts. Several days ago they did, however, announce that they will file a complaint against Lambert's doctors for a premeditated murder and not providing the disabled patient with food and life support. It is hard to say whether the complaint will bring any effect, but based on today's statement, it seems that Vincent Lambert Lambert's story is coming to an end. At this stage, the patient was unplugged from life support as the process of fading out, as the French doctors described it, began. This is a highly controversial issue, since the legal status of the patient has not yet been decided. Some experts deem the patient to be severely disabled, while others believe they are dealing with a so-called end-of-life situation. This dispute has not yet been decided. The French legal system is not precise when it comes to to this issue, which allows for various interpretations of this case. The mysterious peacock scandal in Brazil, revolving around hacked phones and intercepted messages between journalists and left-wing opposition parties, saw further developments today. The anonymous Twitter account, The Mysterious Peacock, has published new material heavily indicating that US journalist Graham Greenwald has been engaged in corrupt practices in an effort to unseat President Jair Bolsonaro. The scandal began when Greenwald, working for the online news publication The Intercept, leaked a number of conversations between Minister of Justice Sergio Moro and prosecutors working on the car wash corruption investigation, an investigation that landed the former socialist president Luis da Silva with a prison sentence. The mysterious Peacock Twitter account has since leaked text messages showing that Greenwald and The Intercept team had doctored some of Moro's conversations and that MP Jean Willis sold his seat in Parliament to David Miranda. Glenn Greenwald's husband. President Bolsonaro had earlier stated that he has full trust in Sergio Moro. Moro is a national asset. He's a man who achieved the turning point in that great evil that has plagued the country for decades, the question of corruption. About the leak, nobody is certain what was published. There are computer programs that simulate conversations between two people. The latest batch of messages leaked by the mysterious Peacock allege Willis hasn't received the money he's owed for selling a seat. David Miranda has allegedly suggested using Leandro de Mori, the main editor at Intercept, or the head of the Socialist Party, Paolo Pimenta, to transfer the money to Willis. The mysterious Peacock scandal has resulted in an official investigation being launched against Greenwald, with new details expected to be released in the coming weeks. Thank you very much for joining me here this evening at Poland Daily. I'm John Carter. Stay tuned after the break for Poland Daily Weather. It's followed by the business, then the culture, the history, and finally the travel. Hello and welcome to Poland Daily Weather. Overnight lows will be from 9 degrees in Lublin and up to 14 degrees in Gdańsk. Showers will be appearing in the northern parts of the country, also in Bydgoszcz, Warsaw and Białystok. Most clear skies will be seen in Zielona Góra, Poznań, Łódź and Lublin. Tomorrow during the day the maximum temperature will be 20 degrees in Krakow and 19 degrees in Rzeszów and a lot of showers will be appearing throughout the whole country but there will be quite a bit of sun as well. Warsaw will see 16 degrees and the minimum will be seen in Łódź and it will be 15 degrees Celsius. This is all for tonight. Thank you. Poland Daily Business Edition. Tonight we'll talk about the European issues because the ongoing struggle between those who have a higher concentration of European power in Brussels, that means more federal Europe, less 
independent countries and those who want to keep Europe simple, business-oriented and leave as much as possible decision to the state. Artur Rublewski of Lazarski University is our uh, guest. Uh, doctor, what do you think about this process in light of the recent uh, summit of European Union and three days discussion on who will be the chairman of European Co Commission? I think uh, this situation only confirms that we still are a confederation where the national voice is counting first of all. So the states take decisions and the states in the European Council are actually imposing what will happen. Uh, it shows that the European Parliament, which is a kind of federal, the most uh, federalized organ in the European Parliament is not functioning as the enthusiasts of federalism would like because, for example, the system of lead candidates or Spitzenkandidaten has been completely ignored. So it shows that, again, we, the states, member states, are taking decisions and unfortunately still Germany and France is still um, making decisions for everybody else. It shows, for example, that they pushed their own candidates for top positions in the European Parliament. I mean the head of the European Commission you and the head the of European Spitzen Central Bank. You mentioned the process. That's something that emerged in 2014. Um, the Parliament itself came up with the idea of pursuing uh, or selecting the candidates for the top jobs as if they were uh, Euro parliaments of the independent or, or countries parliament. They are not. And the, the critic says this is something outside of the treaties. The Europe is based on treaties. Uh, member states agreed on something, put their, their signatures are complying with the treaties, yet the European officials, instead of following the treaties, they're creating their own rights, their own customs, and want to influence the, the legislature or, or their constituency, which is their countries, basically. Of course, the states, some states, top most important states in the European Union or the strongest are trying to some extent to revise two most important documents uh, creating the European Union now, the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union and the Treaty on the European Union, and they are trying to do it to its own benefit. We see the Tribunal of Justice of European Union acting of, outside of the treaties. Of course, it goes outside of the treaty because we know very well it comes out of the treaty that judiciary is under competences of the national governments, of the governments of member states. So they should not uh, impose its own will or its own vision how the judiciary should function on member states. If we want to do it, we should change the treaty, the Lisbon Treaty, officially. That's actually interesting because the uh, European uh, Court of Justice has to decide about the Polish reform of justice system. This uh, uh, decision will be probably uh, made known in early September or in September before the uh, general election here in Poland. And obviously there are voices of those who are saying this is the decision you should comply. Maybe the, the right answer is this is not based on treaties and uh, th th this is opinion. You, the tribunal has to act within the limits of the treaties. The if it acts mm -hmm. outside, it's not uh, valid. It's, it's nothing. It's as if they commented on the weather. It's just an uh, advisory opinion. Uh, for example, the recent, the most recent decisions of the European Court of Justice on Poland is, for example, absolutely amazing because it has been made even after Poland has uh, backed down from certain things 
issues regarding, for example, retirement right. age of judges. So actually there is no existing problem anymore. Still, the European Court of Justice uh, has been uh, has made the decision uh, and wasted our time and our taxes talking about something which is still not anymore on the table According as a problem. to your assessment, are we heading towards the unified European Union, the country or federal state structure or this will not come in next 10 years at least? Of course, it will take long time before we will unify uh, our uh, European Union if and become all. like the federal states of, Europe, of Europe, like United States, for example. It will take long time. Uh, why? Uh, not because, for example, Poland is blocking anymore. I see the problem in Germany and France. We simply are afraid of the unification or federalization in the system where two states or three states are imposing its own will on others. Before, unless we become equal, and as strong as other states we hear in Central Europe, we cannot agree to any federalization and whoever is trying to speed up the process is simply making a mistake. I actually hope that you will say that we'll never reach the level of federalization, but... The Eurozone is a test for federalization and we see only problems in the Eurozone. So it shows that we failed to some extent to create something workable and that's why Poland is not uh, now happy to enter the Eurozone because it might mean uh, the problems. Right and uh, we don't want that and we don't really believe in the managerial skills of uh, the government of Germany and France especially especially that our area. and European Central Bank is located in Frankfurt so we also take into account uh, being a little bit afraid that maybe the German perspective on uh, finances will be taken as priority first but of all this uh, <coughs> summit unveiled some uh, procedures or uh, um, or uh, discussions that were, were hidden before in the European Union. We saw only the results, we didn't know how those results are being achieved. Of course, so to some extent the deficiency of democracy in the European Union, criticized before, has been confirmed because the final decisions on who will take the top positions uh, has been made where? in Osaka, in Japan, behind closed doors. So if we complain that there is no democracy in the European, to some extent it's true, because the decision or the situation from this um, uh, last weeks confirmed that few people make decisions for others somewhere and, and is nobody not knows acceptable. what's going on. And for example, again, the lead candidates' names has been ignored. I'm not saying they were perfect uh, people for, for the top jobs, but at least the European Parliament was counting on being taken into account in this final, uh, final decision. But this expectation was also outside of the treaties. Uh, Dr. Artur Rublewski, sir, thank you very much for this insight and that thank was you. it for tonight Poland Daily Business. <laughs>
Welcome to Poland Daily Culture. I'm John Carter, and on today's episode, we're here at Obvox Palace. So come and join me as we take a trip around classic Polish culture. Otwot Grand Palace in Otwotsk Wielki is otherwise known as the Jezierce Family Palace or Bielinski Family Palace. It is a historic residence located on an artificial island in an Oxbow Lake of the River Vistula in Otwotsk Wielki. It is the former summer home of the Bielinski family, all aristocracy from Chihanów County in Mazovia, who maintained a close relationship with the Saxon court. But the family heirs squandered the family wealth in the 18th century, and the palace became in the end closely associated with the Jezierski family, following the palace's acquisition by Jacek Jezierski. It remained in the hands of that family until the communist period of 1945-1989. The palace was restored and opened to the public as Interiors Museum or Museum of Design in Otwotsk, a satellite branch of the Warsaw National Museum. Mr. Stefan, welcome to Poland Daily Culture. Now you are an expert in uh, furniture. Could you tell us about this piano? This is a musical instrument, a vertical piano, also called a giraffe. To be able to say something more about it, I would suggest to go back to the 18th century. Let me present it first. At the end of the 18th century, cameralism began to spread, as well as creating music in small groups, mainly in palaces, in the courts of the rich nobility and in the patricians' headquarters. They were the rich bourgeoisie. In the early 19th century, this trend spread rapidly and began to embrace more and more people. The middle class bourgeoisie joined as well as the lower class. What also emerged was a tradition of spending time together, during which playing instruments played a vital role. Spędzania czasu. Czasu, w którym muzykowanie odgrywało znaczną rolę. Do tego były potrzebne instrumenty. Grywano na the people would play harps, guitars, violins or cellos, but the most popular instrument was the piano. The piano was created around the middle of the 18th century and gained most popularity at the beginning of the 19th century. The first grand pianos took up a lot of space, which is why a decision to reduce their dimensions was made. This resulted in the creation of table pianos, one of which I will show you in a moment. Another creation was the vertical piano, for example, the giraffe. These names come from the shape of the Renaissance box in its upper part, which resembles the neck of a giraffe. The instrument which I present to you comes from the Warsaw factory of Friedrich Wuholtz, one of the most distinguished companies operating in the capital of the Kingdom of Poland. This company was known for creating the instruments for one of the best European musicians at the time, and that was for Frédéric Chopin. Frédéric Chopin played on these instruments, and he even owned Buchholz pianos. He also recommended them to the best pianist producer in Europe and even in the world, Julian Pleyel, the son of Frederick, who was practicing in Paris at the time. This piano was made in 1825 and is characteristic of the early Biedermeier period, which combines with the stylish forms of the previous era, the Empire style. 
antyku do sztuki, sztuki. It is characterized by the use of beautiful patterned mahogany, a rich red material, which then was very fashionable. Some elements here were also used as columns, which refer to ancient history, to Greek and Roman art. The vertical pianos were massively popular also due to the fact that at the beginning of the 19th century, a large emphasis was made on the musical education of both young boys and girls. It was even said that this emphasis was made larger on the younger girls. Music notation was taught, playing instruments and singing. During meetings with family or friends, these young people would show off their skills and offer a pleasant pastime to those around them. A lot of chamber music was created at the time to be performed on the instruments and songs were mainly sung by the young ladies. A także pieśni śpiewanych głównie przez młode panie. I suggest we move on to the next room in the palace and see another item. Okay then, Stefan, so we have another example of a classic piano. What do we have here? Jest to fortepian stołowy, o którym już wcześniej wspominałem. This here is a table piano, which I mentioned earlier. I said that pianos gained considerable popularity, but some of them were simply too big for an intimate kind of playing in small rooms. Pierwszym takim krokiem do the first step to give them a compact form was to construct table pianos. Fortepianów stołowych. Ten egzemplarz, który tutaj znajduje się w Pałacu w Otwocku, należy do jednych z This particular piano, which sits in the Otwock Palace, is one of the smallest ones. It was created around 1800, most probably in the region of Vienna, and served to accompany singing as well as to individual play on this kind of instrument. Na tego rodzaju instrumencie. Można było go wykorzystywać. It could be used as a table, as it is at this moment, but I will show it to you in all its glory. W całej okazałości. Teraz już. And now you can play on it. Mr. Stefan, thank you very much for your time. Dziękuję bardzo. Thank you very much for joining us here from Otvox Palace. We'll be back again same time tomorrow for another episode of Poland Daily Culture. I'm here in this hidden pearl in Warsaw. This is the Jewish cemetery on Ulitsa Okapova. This cemetery opened in 1806, and since then it has served the Jewish community in Warsaw. But it's more than that. It's a valuable historical resource. When so much else was destroyed, during the Second World War particularly, this place survived remarkably. We'll be meeting some of the people who are restoring it, who are keeping it going. So do join me on this exciting episode of Poland Daily History.
I'm here in the Jewish cemetery on Akapova Street with the director of the cemetery, Shemizwaf Spielmann. Mr. Spielmann, thank you for joining us. Pleasure. Thank you. Could you just say a little bit about how you came to be the director of the cemetery? Oh, it was about 17 years ago. I, uh, I am the member of the Jewish community of Warsaw, and uh, in 2002, they decided to change the person and the position of the director of the cemetery because of many reasons. And uh, because I worked uh, for a couple of years already for so-called Hevra Kadisha, which is the burial society, the society which helps um, with preparing the bodies for the, for the proper Jewish burial, yes. I, I was given a proposition to, to get this job. And uh, I agreed. And so, since then, for the past 17 years, I, uh, I, wor I work here Excellent. as the employee of the Jewish community of Warsaw and director of the cemetery. And so you're responsible for everything that goes on in the cemetery? Absolutely. Everything what's, uh, what's necessary to be done, everything what's going on over here, also for this film, I'm responsible Excellent. for. Excellent. And, the, and, and it's actually quite a big responsibility, I imagine, because it's actually quite a historic monument in itself, and, and it's a that's, huge place as well. That's true. In 99%, this is museum. This is, this is the old, old site. This is the old place uh, of the hundreds of years of Jewish history in, Vash, in Warsaw. But also, this cemetery is still active. There is a new section where, which still serves for the Jewish community of Warsaw, and not only for them. Generally, we are burying still, still, still bury people, Jew, Jewish, Jewish people who die in Warsaw, and those who died outside of Warsaw. But I want want to be to be buried here at our cemetery. And they can come to the cemetery to, as well. That's right. And, and what a large, I imagine a large percentage of your work must actually be involved in trying to keep restore the cemetery, try and keep it in good order in as much as you can keep 33 hectares right. of anything in good order. You know, this, is, this work is for generations. Unfortunately, without, uh, within the last 60, 70 years, you know, the cemetery was, uh, was neglected in the back, back in 50s, 60s, 70s of, of, 19, of the 20th century. And all this forest grew within that time. Many of the stones were gone, you know, Many, many reasons. Stolen, damaged, destroyed. You know, and to bring the view from before the war, which was like a kind of representative, etc., needs, you know, lots, lot, lot of time. A lot of time. Generations and hundreds of human hands. And, and you have many people to help you in your work? Or is it all volunteers? Not really. I have, I, I have two, personally, I have two physical workers. Right. Uh, also also the, the employees of the Jewish community of Warsaw. And the rest is based on the, sometimes, of the group of volunteers who help us, you know, to clean the section, to clean one section, ten sections, whatever. But still, uh, even if, you, if, if they make an order over there, in two months, they have to do the nature, same job. Nature is very tenacious. And un, uh, you cannot win it, you know, that's, that's how it is. And, and I noticed as we were walking around early this morning, over in that direction, there's a, what looks like a very large, new, modern construction that's underway. Yeah. What's that going to be? Actually, this is the pr f completing the project which was done in, back in the 30s, last century. They, uh, they wanted to make a big mausoleum for the fighters of 1920. Right. under Piłsudski soldiers okay. who f fight for freedom and independence of, Pol of, Pol of Poland. Uh, they started to, to make this big project. They never completed. Why? Because the war in 1939 broke up. Yeah. That's why uh, f after the war and until one year ago, until 2018, there were there were just there was just old fence around and nothing and nothing else and the trees inside, so uh, the f foundation of uh, national culture of Poland, the governmental foundation, decided to complete this work, and uh, they, they dismantle everything and they put uh, a new new walls and there's gonna be a huge monument like a memorial over there of course the, the original project wanted to have the, like a uh, uh, grave sites of those soldiers of course they they're not alive for many many years already and they they spread of all all over the cemeteries now so it's gonna be just a site of memorial and nothing and nothing else Hopefully, within a couple of months, they're going to finish. I think I'm right in saying there are probably something over 200,000 people 
250, actually. 250,000. Right. And have you been able to map everybody and identify everybody and identify where their graves are? Is this, oh. is this a continuing project? Actually, it's about to be finished oh, already. Right. Because it's true that there is 250,000 people buried here, but it covers also a mass grave from the ghetto time. It covers some sections which are put on the top of each other with putting another layer of the earth uh, over there. So individual, on the other side, individual, single graves, when you can see, it's about 100,000. Okay. And when I came here to, to work 17 years ago, that time and now uh, also, they are coming every day, tourists from all over the world, and they're asking, you know, they're looking for the graves of their ancestors. That time, I had no idea where to, where to look for, because original documentation was gone, went up in flames in 1943, yes. together with the offices. So basically, we didn't know at all who is buried where. That's why I decided, after a few months of replying the same answer to everybody, that I have no idea, I cannot help because I have no database. I decided to, just for trial, to make one, uh, one section registered. I picked up one section and I registered all the Matsaivas, row after row, Matsaiva after Matsaiva. I liked this, uh, this work, so I decided to do another one. Uh, and next one. And I do it until today. By today, I've registered by myself about 90,000 graves. Right. And they are in my database. Of course, many of the graves are un unreadable anymore. Uh, they carry no, no plaques. They were stolen, broken, whatever. But uh, still, there are about 90,000 graves in my, in my database. About seven, eight years ago, there came one American uh, guy from Chicago, I believe, who liked this, this work I do with with the registration and he decided to speed it up. So he hired a group of students of Hebrew who swept the whole area within a year. They took pictures, they put it online. So that's why there are two databases. One is online, one is, one is mine in my, in my computer. But I have much more grace than they do. What can you say about Turin that hasn't been said before? Well, it all depends on how you look at it. At any rate, we're gonna give it our best shot to be a little different. Turin is perhaps the prime example of Gothic architecture in the world. Its medieval quality is virtually pristine. And fitting this setting, it's also the birthplace of Nicholas Copernicus, who taught us that the Earth goes around the sun and not the other way around. I'm not going to say that this is everything you always wanted to know about Torun, but we're afraid to ask, but uh, it's close to it. This is certainly a city not to be missed. It's a pleasure to be enjoyed slowly and deliberately. It would take a couple of weeks to see everything in this city and really soak in the atmosphere, and that would still be pushing it. But we are doing our dead level best to show you the greatest hits of Torun. So sit back and enjoy the next few episodes as Torun is unveiled before your eyes. I'm Will, this is Poland Daily Travel, and we love to see you watching. Like us on YouTube and subscribe if you really, really like us. So join us for Poland Daily Travel Does Torun. Welcome back to Poland Daily Travel, and we're in Torun, in a very significant place. The ruins of an ancient Teutonic castle, yes? The very first Teutonic castle in Polish lands, yeah. right? Uh -huh. uh, because what is really important is that Teutonic Knights were invited here by our prince, Konrad of Mazowia, in the 12th and 13th century. Uh, and that was the place where they started, mm -hmm. right? That was the first castle of the 120 that they constructed uh, altogether. Uh, and Torin they, was they the made first. 120 castles. Right. And this was the first before Malbork and all the others. Malbork is very famous. This was the first. Yeah. Okay. And Torin was also the first city out of the 20, uh, 80 other cities that they founded. Uh, they founded 80 cities. Yeah. The yeah. most famous being Torun, Malbork, Malbork 
uh, Grudens, uh, Popovo, Framborg, many, yeah. many cities. Which all have castles yeah. uh, or yeah. significant remnants, right? Many of these castles yeah. are actually better preserved than ours, but um, the reason why this castle is in ruins is not because of any wars yes, between Teutonic Knights and, uh, and Poland. Because uh, this uh, is the effect of the, actually, of the uprising of mm -hmm. the Thurunians against the Teutonic Knights. Right, okay. Because during the 200 years of governing of Teutonic Knights here in this region, uh -huh. people of Torun actually got pretty angry with Teutonic Knights. Um, first of all, because of uh, imposing higher taxes, uh, not letting the citizens to power, uh, and making the trade difficult, yeah? Right. And the trade was the source of income, the source of wealth. Of Why, how did they impede the trade or, or, or reduce the trade? What were they doing? Blocking the river or...? No, they, it was uh, imposing taxes. new laws. Taxes imposing and new laws. laws, exactly. Just to control the everybody. To control, yeah. and they yeah. also were trading themselves. So that was like kind ah. of a competition. Yeah. Uh, so it all led that uh, to the point that Torunians got so angry with the Teutonic Knights that they decided the best way to show the hatred towards them would be the attack and the destruction of the castle. So what happened? They just. Uh, what kind of weapons do they have? Do you know the story uh, more about that? You can I see some of the, those it. examples over there, so we yeah. can like maybe later shoot them uh, yeah. okay. inside. All right. So these were simple, simple, simple weapons actually. Yeah. But there is also a legend uh, that uh, says that there was a traitor in the castle, uh -huh. uh, and precisely that was a cook uh -huh. uh, named Jordan, uh -huh. and that uh, he, after the um, a bit. Um, alcoholic supper of the Teutonic Knights, <laughs> <laughs> he climbed up the tower, which unusually was in the center of yeah. the castle, uh -huh. the very tall tower, and with his huge spoon, he gave a sign of the people waiting around. A huge around. spoon? Yeah. He had like a big the spoon? Cook spoon, right? Okay. Like a cook spoon? Okay. Uh, so uh, maybe there is something in it because the castle was taken very quickly. Uh-huh. Uh, so maybe there is some Maybe they were all uh, drunk and they just, he let them in, in that or legend. something. Exactly. Sounds like he let them in. So the tower yeah. fell this way, and yeah. also according to that legend, still with the poor cook inside. Oh. So the tower fell this way, so these are the remnants These of are the this remnants tower. here of this tower. Exactly, right exactly. Here. Okay, because yeah. this wall obviously is a lit, much later construction just to encase. So there would have been an old wall here, and I guess the tower fell into that wall. It fell this way, yeah. outside of the castle walls, which were also very unusual, well, like a horseshoe, as you can see, they're half round. Huh. That was the only castle of that shape, okay. because the next Teutonic castles and other castles, actually, they were more regular, rectangular, right? Uh, so more typical. And this was the only one unusual which was sort of unusual oval, oval sort shape. Of, yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. That's true. Probably because it was based on a pre-Slavic settlement that was here before. Right. So That's this the, would be. That would explain this shape. Even a thousand years before that, perhaps, or something like yeah. that. Yeah. 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 Okay. Stay with us. Poland Daily Travel. We're at the castle, and we're on the uh, uh, around the medieval wall, and we'll be seeing more of that in Torun, the medieval wall and the river beyond. Stay tuned. So uh, this is the last remaining element of the of the castle. Is that right? Exactly. That's the only element that was not destroyed by uh -huh. Torunians, okay. and that was made on purpose. Uh -huh. Because this place was very different from the rest of the castle. Right. Uh, any ideas what this could be? Uh, I have no idea, but it seems to be set apart from the castle. Was it a cooking place or something? Not exactly, not exactly. It was placed above a small river. Yeah. And this place was actually the Teutonic toilet. It was a Teutonic toilet? Yes, we are in the Teutonic toilet. That's fantastic. Okay, because I mean, when you gotta go, you gotta go, and it doesn't matter Middle Ages or not, you know. Uh, so that's important, that's but it's no longer thing. a toilet. No, obviously not. As it you is, can see, right now this tower is adapted for an exhibition. Yeah. This exhibition keep changing, but this exhibition right now, as you can see, is about a way of torturing people in Middle Ages. Ooh. So we have different um, nasty things here. That Let's look around and see what we've got. Body. Yeah. Uh, so what we've we got here, we've got, this is a chastity belt for women. Uh, that's actually for the prostitutes. For prostitutes? For the ladies of uh -huh. the nightlife, yeah. yes. Okay. Um, <laughs> this is the uh, mask of suffering yeah. uh, with a beam yeah, uh -huh. that was uh, placed on criminals. And basically. this must be for Pinocchio, if you're telling lies, is that right? 
For yeah. men. You would wear this on yes. your head if you were telling <laughs> lies, yeah? Because it would cover your whole head. nose, right? <laughs> As it was growing longer. Very interesting. And what's this? This is again uh, for, um, for the ladies to protect their innocence. To protect their innocence, okay. Because yes. uh, you want to make sure that happens. What about this one with the, oh, there's another Pinocchio one, isn't it? Oh, this was put on the people who are lying. So, it, it, so that was right, oh, yeah. actually. So it is Pinocchio. Pinocchio so. yeah. yeah, exactly. We have a couple of different variations of those masks here, right? Yeah. Okay. Some very interesting implements. I don't think, uh, I think in the Middle Ages, people had a very different idea of, uh, of relaxation. Uh, especially on this chair, for example, yeah. the Spanish chair, so I can, you can guess uh, what it was used for, right? Yeah. For sitting, but it was not Talk about sitting on a pin cushion or pins and needles or something. Something like that, but yeah. I think it's even worse if you look at those uh, pins sticking out. Uh, they yeah. look really uncomfortable. It is hard to believe that people would do that to each other. Yeah. And actually, it went through skin, through muscles. Oh, yeah. hard what stuff. What is the problem? And uh, here we have the, the face of the pig. Uh, exactly, that was for people who exaggerated with uh, drinking alcohol. They drank too much alcohol. I was going to yeah. suggest that it might be people who ate too much, but it was probably drinking too much alcohol. For drunk cards. Because that, that would make you crazy, cards. right? Yeah, the, yeah, they probably didn't. Like yeah. Piggy style. <laughs> Piggy style? Really? <laughs> okay. That's my all right. idea. Oh, all right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Yeah, some stuff for crushing the fingers. Oh, yeah, it's a finger crusher, that's always useful. Yeah, yeah. from time to time, yeah. Yeah, you never know when you'll need that. Well, this is really, really creeping me out. I gotta be honest with you. I mean, medieval torture. Oh, it's like in the Tarantino movie where the guy goes, uh, in Pulp Fiction, he goes, I'm gonna go medieval on him. He doesn't say that, actually, exactly, but this is a family show. Be, yeah. This is a family show. Okay. <laughs> I'll get bleeped out if I repeat th that line. Uh, and these are just more of the, of the sort of more torture of the masks. masks. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. What about this one with the, <coughs> with the horn here? <clears throat> uh, that was, uh, the horn was for uh, putting the water inside, yeah. which was uh, constantly flowing into your mouth. So, so like a sort of it's uh, like, type of a Chinese torture, but uh, a bit well, different. No, it's yes. like waterboarding, isn't it, in a sense? Yeah. Ancient yeah. waterboarding. But I, I don't see how you could survive because the water, there's no way for you to get it out of your mouth. I hope they stopped at some point. Yeah, <laughs> they, yeah they because if you kept doing end. that, you would certainly drown. I mean, what a sure. horrible way to go. Yeah. yeah, terrible, terrible. Good Lord. Not nice, not nice. Okay, folks, that's it. Uh, we're going outside now. It's enough medieval torture. Let's go. Let's go to a... I think I need place. a drink after all that. That was terrible. After the yeah. water mask. <laughs> <laughs> not, not with a water mask.